Can I please have your attention? My name is John Azarias, and for those who don't know me, I am the uh, chair of the executive board of Greek Australian business leaders. Uh, I would like to uh, ask the Minister Rob, Sto Minister Rob Stokes to join us and welcome everybody. We owe it to the ancient Greeks, in fact, uh, I suppose, the art of urban planning. It was uh, Hippodamus of Miletus, who uh, is credited as being the first uh, identified urban planner uh, with his grid layout for the port of Piraeus and uh, Miletus as well. And that same uh, sort of network, geometric uh, network of, of, of grids, uh, some of the very earliest uh, uh, post-colonisation uh, post settlements of Australia, uh, where you see the echoes of the grid uh, plan uh, of Hippodamus and this uh, Hip, um, hippodamium planning uh, you can see in, uh, in global cities right around the world. Uh, but more than this, um, Hippodamus also noted uh, that city was more, or city planning was more than just about the fabric of the streetscape itself. It was about creating a shared space, a context where people could communicate, whether that be to exchange goods, services or ideas, and to build a civilization. Consul General of Greece, uh, Yanis Malikourtis, members of the board of the uh, executive uh, board of Greek Australian business leaders, George Confos and Nick Andriotakis, Secretary of the Lysikides Foundation, Michael Diamond. F lady, uh, friends, dear friends, uh, I've entitled my brief comments, uh, The Classical Greek Achievement, An Australian Perspective. Uh, after 20 months of absence, for the reason we know all too well, it's a great pleasure for the Executive Board of Greek Australian Business Leaders to be hosting this afternoon's gathering. Well before the Greeks, the peoples of Mesopotamia and Egypt had developed outstanding inventions and contributions to knowledge in a number of areas. Those contributions were later refined in the Levant. We know that the Greeks were definitely not the original inventors. So what was so new, so noteworthy about the Greek contribution? What the Greeks did was to take these inventions and develop conceptual frameworks around them, ways of looking at and working with them. There are different words for what they were the first to introduce, systems, critical analysis, structures, principles, theories, definitions, categories, methods, introspection. The Greeks created the scientific method, grammatical categories, political theory, and philosophical and aesthetic principles. It is no accident that most of these words are Greek. In other words, they were the first to create a governance a discipline, an order around these various fields of thought and action, which had been discovered well before them. Governance lies at the root of most human endeavors. Doing it well is very hard and requires high levels of imagination, intellectual effort, and diplomacy. Good governance systems enable predictability they reduce confusion, waste, and disorder. They make connections, draw inferences, facilitate analysis. As a result, they speed up progress. That quantum or meta leap into governance was the essence of the Greek achievement. What made it even more impressive was that they combined this conceptualization with a specifically Greek characteristic namely Lytotis, the ability to express complex ideas in a pithy way. The Greeks loved Lytotis. They still do. Anyone who mastered it, rhetoricians, generals, playwrights, was admired and quoted. The consummate exponent of Lytotis was Sappho, the great poet from Lesbos considered by the Greeks to be the greatest poet of all. 
So the Greeks' introduction of conceptualization, structure, and method, together with their love of succinctness, of going to the essence of things, created a very seminal moment in human history because ever since that approach has shaped the way humankind has looked at not just scientific disciplines, but social activities. It catapulted the Greeks from being simple seafarers and peasants to the level of philosophers and theoreticians whose influence on the Western mind has been incalculable. Apart from admiration for the brilliance of that Greek achievement and the intellectual leap it entailed, there was another reason for all that global enthusiasm. And this leads me to the second point I want to stress. That is that, so this was a culture which did not look at bloodlines, which rejected tribalism, and which valued only an adherence to a system of thought based around concepts like equality before the law, like a love of examining and reflecting and critically analyzing. This all-embracing, very human approach can be seen time and time again in Greek literature over millennia, starting with Homer. I want to begin um, my talk with um, the 1750s um, in the fashionable salons of London and Paris where talk was a buzz that uh, the news was emerging of a fabulous ancient city that had been discovered in the deserts of Syria, a whole grand metropolis unknown to the West. That city, of course, was Palmyra. This was a world crying out for new architectural forms that weren't associated with kings and monarchs, that weren't about tyrants and subjects. It was about an architecture for a republic of citizens in which the relationship between the individual and the state was being radically and completely rethought. So the new really discovered Greek architecture offered an architectural language and form that was democratic uh, in its sensibility, that embodied the principles and values of the Enlightenment and was transnational and cosmopolitan in character. From the very beginning, it was an architectural form that has been associated with kind of the restraint of absolute power and democratic, republican, and parliamentary forms of government. Classical architecture has been seen as providing a fitting home for the leaders of parliamentary systems. Greek architecture is a way of indicating power and authority without ideas of kingship. And of course, the best example is the US, which turns to the neoclassical in terms of its constant um, uh, desires to, to embody in itself. You know, the, the thing about Greek architecture was that it was an architectural tradition that stood out from and apart from national traditions. But I think the other thing that we want to stress on our panel is that the influence of Greece is more than just an adherence to forms. It's an aesthetic sensibility, but it's also a spirit. Because the Greeks realized that cities need places for people to gather together, to share resources, to converse, to interact, to come together as a community. At the heart of every Greek city was the agora, the marketplace, the open space, the place where people come together to talk, to philosophy, to do, to do philosophy, to do politics. Um, and it's this idea of the open space where people come together that seems to me to be captured in things and gestures, like, for example, Francis Greenaway's um, uh, fabulous um, uh, fountain houses that were designed uh, for Sydney. You can see um, uh, a detail of it, one there, and then this uh, one here, now sadly um, demolished. And I wanted to talk specifically about the... the uh, obviously the Sydney Opera House, uh, Jorn Utzon's masterpiece in relation to the Acropolis. And often Utzon's building is talked about in terms of the influences from China, from Elsinore Castle, um, uh, from, uh, even from Mayan architecture. But I think the resonances with the Acropolis um, to us are very powerful as well. So you can see how it's a set of forms arranged 
uh, on uh, an artificial base, a constructed topography. So you can see there's the base that Utzon so uh, marvellously organised to contain all the, the service functions with the shelves above, and you can see the dialogue between the base uh, and the Tarpian Walk. And you can see then in this old photo of the Acropolis, in fact, the earth leaking out of the artificial perimeter. And remember that the Acropolis is in fact a construction as well, and this is the, the Mycenaean basis of the Acropolis, and you can see the successive walls, still one part of that wall in existence. And then in a sense the, the Acropolis is actually a constructed topography, as is the Opera House. And of course the Opera House then organises itself very much in a Greek manner, to my eyes, with the two amphitheatres, again a Greek form, and to me I can't help thinking of the great amphitheatre at Pergamum, in terms of the, work, the ground worked and, of course, the gathering of people for culture, which is the invention of the Greek theatre. And then the space in between, and this is Woodson's original competition drawing where he said it's actually the dialogue between the two shells and he was the only person in the competition to have the two shells, the two halls, side by side on the point. And, of course, in the Acropolis, the movement up and these are Doxiadises perspectives where you're between the temple and you see open sky through the central um, perspective. And then the construction, where in the Greek temple, in fact, every stone is visible in the construction. You can see only the iron clamps aren't visible, but you can see the order of Greek architecture uh, is incredibly clear. Utzon's work, the ground plane, the modelling of the ground plane, the exactitude of the elements. Remember that the base of the Acropolis of the Parthenon is in fact curved. Remember the entesis, the last column is pushed in more than the others, the accuracy of Utzon's construction and even the interest in the line. And so Utzon's, Utzon's sections of the interior of the hall and the various profiles of Doric columns, uh, Doric capitals. And so this sort of resonance, which is very much a visual thing that architects like to talk about. But of course the other great parallel between these buildings to conclude is how they are in fact the whole image and character of their city and in fact of their country. And how the Opera House sits in its majestic detachment in the middle of our harbour, an element for all of us to marvel at in exactly the same way that all of Athens, all of Greece and in fact all of history looks to the Parthenon and the Acropolis. Now, I would like also to welcome, we have Minister Stokes here, we have the, uh, uh, the speaker, uh, O'Day, Jonathan O'Day, and also we have with us uh, Shadow Treasurer, uh, Daniel Muhi, and uh, member of the Legislative Council, uh, Peter Poulos. So, thank you for joining us. The buildings I like deliver a sense of civic worth, they seek to remind us that we belong to something great and can make this representation in the architecture. That architecture removes any doubt about the fallacy of the human condition if indeed it represents certain eternal and universal values. Architecture can remove doubt that our lives are not worthwhile. Secondly, they understand scale and approach. How do you come to the building? And what is that about? It's about the human approach to buildings. They deliver a sculptural understanding of the object which is being observed by the eye at human level. And Doxiades is incredible. But Xenakis, who worked with Corbusier and others would understand these concepts of the power of architecture. They are all buildings that have a geometric basis, a universal idea about mathematics, and they subscribe to the concept of finding beauty from nature and understanding that geometry and numbers are part of nature. They are reliant on Pythagoras and trigonometry. Great buildings must understand Pythagoras. They are also relied on Euclid. They are also relied on Plato and his ideas of solids. And then there were these other ideas about the geometry that dealt with things that 
I think this is wrong. Look at the decoration of the triglyphs. What is this? This is the Doric temple. This is the Parthenon. And it's about structure and about arresting the eye and giving delight. Now, the Opera House, isn't it interesting how he built the Acropolis? He built it. And he built it very consciously with amphitheatres and wanted to see it like this. Hmm? Why? Because there's something primordial about it. There's something that connects us to the universe. The, the thing about being Greek is it's about being human and understanding that we're nothing and that everything else matters and finding what it is that matters, finding it and looking at things that make you want to get weak at the knees. Um, but isn't it interesting when you see it in the way that architects see it? And architects see history differently to people other than architects. We don't see it as a continuum. Edith Hall is interesting. She's an historic. I find it really boring to be an historian in a sense without being rude because we see history as though it's today. So I see the Parthenon as though um, it was built today because how exciting it would be to build something like that for the first time. Goodness me. But look at how amazing it is in its landscape. I, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And what is that? It's not about the coins or in the Greek Orthodox Church they put the Opera House and the Parthenon, you know, the, in the symbols. It's not about that. It's that it represents the whole of humanity. It doesn't represent its place. The Opera House doesn't represent Sydney. How can it? It represents our relationship to the earth. And it does it through geometry. It does it through architecture. And it's a geometric form. Look how simple it is. It's two lines, two lines. It has optimism, like the Parthenon, optimistic. It doesn't go inward to the city, it doesn't face the city. It faces out, like the Parthenon. It is looking to the horizon, to the future, to optimism. One of my favourite buildings is this building. I'll go through it quickly. It's in Martin Place. It is very Greek. Poor things. They couldn't get away from it. They went into the same ideas of the Parthenon, which is to create the square root of two in a one-one triangle. It's the golden mean. And in fact, the most interesting thing about this building is that it copies as precisely as any other building in the world the ancient orders, the Acroteria at the top of the Acropolis. This is the Opera House. This is my idea of the processional route up to the Opera House. And I feel like there's an equivalence to the movement up to the Parthenon when I see that sketch. Thank you very much. <laughs> this, o denus isos theoteronti que apathes estin. And I know that Alastair gave me a nice version of this, but it was, it didn't have the proper toni on it. Alastair, do you want to tell us what this means? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so uh, the, 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 mind, yes, the mind is perhaps a kind of uh, divine and uh, feeling, uh, uh, feeling thing. Good. Thank you. Very serious. It has been a wonderful, uh, thought-provoking um, gathering, um, and uh, we owe a lot to our three distinguished speakers, and I would like to thank them on behalf of the Executive Board of Greek uh, Business Leaders for taking the time and talking to us. And the final point that I would like to say is I forgot to mention that another distinguished member of the La Secretis Foundation, Professor Ross Steele, is here with us, and I would like to thank him for attending. So, dear friends, thank you for attending, and please join me in thanking our <laughs>